Oh, yeah. We should be live. I just got a YouTube notification. Good. That was too easy. <laughs> Something wrong. The, the real question is, did it launch on the correct URL? Because it's been doing that lately. Oh, really? Yeah. I see people saying... Where are we? Nope. Larry Beckham says, I see in here. Okay. Yes. Now Colin Jones, I'm seeing it. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Mike Echo. What? Is anyone else getting a Mike Echo? Hopefully you just have it open in two windows. Yeah. <laughs> Your own personal echo. Uh, <clears throat> so, how'd it go? It was good. Uh, and, um, yeah, I don't know what else to say other than it was good. What did uh, you do? Where did you go? What was it all about? <laughs> what was the purpose? I oh, come on. Went, I went to Amsterdam in the European Union okay. to attend the European Where? Testing Conference. What? Yeah, European Testing Conference. Okay, good. <laughs> And uh, I also did a meetup to which only one person arrived, but that was a very special person and we had great fun exploring <laughs> the city. Um, That's awesome. And, and um, I gave a talk on how it is we test software where part of our algorithm is insert human beings. And uh, so I talked about all of the ways that we test to make sure that our citizen science data is as valid and awesome as possible. I'm going to say hi to a bunch of people. You had your chance. Here it comes. Uh, Abraham Cottrell, Arnold Post, Astro B, Bill K, Brooke Mulligetta, Carolyn B, Coalfire, Colin Jones, DKTAZ00, Dusty Reichwin, Gaida Saud, Gordon Dewis, Graham Walbridge, Guido Bibra, Harry M, Henrik Bo Anderson, Janelle Duncan, John Seffield, John Victor, K Spence 303, Quad Libet, Magnus, Thamer, Jensen, Mark Wintle, Michael Jobin, Mr. Tom Harbin. Nancy Crazy Annal, No Ruppenthal, Paranor, 001, Patrick Festa, Peter Quinn, a lot of people today, Peter Wyoff, Poison Toad, Rinstro, Rabbit Holer, Richie Selfridge, Tack Tang, Tom Van Scotter, Uncle Bill Druin, and Zap Fat Zap Van. Hey, everybody. Welcome I to I love that we have a Poison Toad listening. So did you see what happened with the latest SpaceX launch at the beginning of their constellation? I... I... I have been in paperwork mm. chaos. I want to know all the things. Did well, Mr. Steven catch the no, fairing? No, Mr. Steven did not catch the fairing. Mr. Steven tried and was within a few hundred meters, but the fairing <sighs> seemed to land okay and was floating nicely like a boat on the okay. ocean. Only half of it though. And so they're going to recover it and I guess wash the salt out and see if it can be used for other things. Yeah. Again, I wonder where the other half went. <laughs> I don't know exactly <laughs> what that was about. Um, but I guess Mr. Steven only had net for one fairing. So, because I mean, okay. once it scoops up that fairing, then I, mean, I don't know whether they're going to they're gonna drag yeah. it back. They tried to catch it. Now I think they're going to drag it back. I wonder if they need to have two boats to catch both halves of the fairing. I would assume so, right? Because it's not like you yeah. you catch one half and then you transfer it to your barge. Like it's it's a big deal, right? Yeah. So, but because the launch was on a very high sort of velocity trajectory, they weren't able to recover the first stage booster. So, okay. Yeah, but it, it was also highly visible to good chunks. Uh, Scott Manley posted a video this morning showing it mm -hmm. from San Francisco, which was Yeah, really I saw impressive. that. That was awesome. Yeah. So uh, you could see these rockets. And so for the, you know, for the folks on the East Coast who are in Florida and can watch a rocket launch, fine, you know, rub it in. But for the folks on the West Coast, now that SpaceX is using Vandenberg more often, go get reasonably close to the launch facility, go to the beach, places like that, and watch a rocket launch. Super fun. It's there cool. you go. Graham Walbridge says, both fairings are covered and back in port. So, right on. But not in the net, yeah. All right. 
we are going to do an episode. If you're wondering what it is that you have stumbled into, we're going to do an episode of Astronomy Cast. We're going to take roughly 30 minutes, depending on my whim, uh, to do an episode. And then we will stick around and answer your questions about space and astronomy. Only the tough questions, though. So save up the real zingers because that's... You don't like me yeah, anymore. That's what that you are <laughs> sharpened into a pencil of science... And hard questions are the way this happens. So okay. I'm sorry. It's all right. And you're not. If you want to ask them in Russian, that it would be even better. She can handle that. All right. I don't, I don't know. I don't have any, I, I have no idea what you just said. Okay. I heard yet though. That means no, right? Yeah. All right. Here we go. Hi, Chad. Hello, Chad. Astronomy Cast, episode 480, multi stage rockets. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, the director of technology and citizen science at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Welcome back from Thank your you. trip. And welcome back from yours. Yes, Iceland. That was awesome. Super fun. So um, before we get on to this week's show, I just want to thank the folks at Sumo for sending me a awesome beanbag chair. I, it's not an ad, but they sent me one, so I got a free thing. But it is like this gigantic easy chair but a made of beanbag like a beanbag cylinder and what it's going to be great for is actually setting it out on the yard in the summertime with my binoculars and watching the night sky because you can sort of lean back at different angles and rest yourself in the beanbag and look at the sky so this is its this will be its purpose and so thanks to sumo i actually tried one out back at pax many years ago and they're pretty great and i do like these chairs so when they said hey we can send you one i i couldn't i couldn't resist uh and also thanks to people who've been sending me video games i got a that's awesome i, I got a copy of stellaris's new apocalypse expansion which was which was awesome so yeah, it's really hard to, to walk that line between uh, getting free stuff and maintaining your journalistic integrity. So, you know, fair disclosure involved, he says, yes. sit, sitting in front of the uh, telescope that OPT sent us. All right, let's move on to this week's show. The vast majority of rockets are multi-staged affairs. Why is this? What makes this kind of rocket so successful? Today, we look at the ins and outs of multi-stage rockets. We were talking about this before the show. We kind of did this backwards, that the multi-stage is the classic rocket that everyone is familiar with. These, these single-stage rockets are the more advanced, more technologically complicated, more brute force what so why why did we not do this in the other way i don't know it's fine well i can tell you why yeah because i was going in numerical order one many yes right. that's yes done answered that's that's it that's all the logic there was all right so what is the logic behind speaking of logic behind a multi-stage rocket how does this thing work the basic idea is why do you keep carrying your trash with you when you can just dump it off? Now, as, as human beings, ideally we're dumping it off in the recycling bin or the garbage, but if you're a spacecraft, you dump it in the ocean. And so what happens is as these rockets take off, they use up the fuel in a segment of the rocket, either the side boosters or the first stage, and then they get rid of that empty fuel containing now empty unit so they don't have to carry the weight of that fuel tank with them and and that's really all there is to it is throw out your garbage as you go but i think that people don't realize the scale of like how much of a rocket is fuel and how difficult it is to get to space that that it is worthwhile to get rid of that tiny little bit of aluminum and rocket engines so that you can carry more fuel so can you talk just a bit about about the tyranny of the rocket equation and how why this is even necessary 
Well, the the basic idea is you can accelerate faster by applying a force to a smaller mass. And as you take off, you have that constant, which is the mass of your spacecraft and all of the things and stuff that are currently attached to it. So this is the whole space launch system. And, and then you also have the mass of the fuel. And as the mass of the fuel decreases, the mass of the spacecraft doesn't unless you drop bits. And the more mass there is, the harder it is to accelerate it. And, and so you just drop stuff. It's just force equals mass times acceleration. Uh, you want to accelerate more, you hold your force constant and reduce your mass. Right. And I guess the, but the, but that point, like, like 99% of a rocket is the fuel. It's a big can of fuel. Like when you see yes. a rocket on the launch pad, it is just this gigantic tube. Or three cans if you're the space shuttle. Or, or three cans or three cans stock, stacked on top of each other. But in general, it is a, you know, it is cans of fuel with tiny little payloads payloads atop of it. And I think that's the part that that blows me away, pun intended, is is how much of a difference staging rockets versus single stage is in the amount of of launch capacity of, of, of payload that you can get to orbit. And one of the things that we talked about last week is there really isn't a successful way to launch a human carrying or ISS restocking amount of mass into space without using multi-stages at this point. Now, when we say multi-stages, we're referring to actually two totally different kinds of systems. We have the surreal or tandem launch, which is where you have like the old Saturn V's, one stage stacked on top of another. The Saturn V's are actually three separate stages. Then the other kind of system we have is the parallel stage which is what the space shuttle was, what we saw with the Falcon Heavy. Uh, Falcon Heavy was actually a complicated mixed mode launch. But uh, what we see with the space, uh, space shuttle was its full launch system was those two solid rocket boosters that fired in parallel with the main engines on the space shuttle, which were drawing all of their fuel from that external tank. Yeah, and I think the space shuttle is a great example of a fairly complicated array. You've got that space shuttle, that main fuel tank, which is liquid hydrogen and oxygen, with the orbiter bolted on the side with its with its RS-25 engines providing some of the, the power. And then you've got those two gigantic solid rocket boosters and the thing with solid rocket boosters is once you turn those things on, you can't turn them off again. Right. And this is this is one of the extreme concerns for safety for a lot of these systems. And this is where we're starting to see interesting things going on with some of the new designs that some of the companies are coming up with. While Space Launch Systems is continuing to have that solid rocket boosters mounted onto the liquid core, we're starting to see, well, the the Falcon 9, this is stacked liquid fuel. And as we look at the Falcon Heavy, we're, we're now looking at essentially a central core that has two Falcon 9s mounted on the sides. And um, it's just going to get crazier from there. Right, right, exactly. Now, the, what is the downside? I mean, if the upside is that you can essentially use this staging system to, you know, as the cans of fuel are emptied out, you throw the cans away, decreasing the amount of, of mass that you have to carry to space, continue, continue. What is the downside of going this, this way? Well, I mean, the biggest downside is you now have many more points of failure. With, with a single stage, you're relying on one set of engines, you're relying on one set of electronics, you aren't worried about the explosives that separate the stages failing, you're not worried about uh, just all of the different pieces that can stop working. And this is something that I think every space-loving little kid learns when they start launching model rockets. 
an SD's rocket will teach you this in detail. You can run into problems where your first stage doesn't separate correctly, and now you're carrying around um, basically a bomb that's trying to fire while blocked. Now, luckily, that's not a thing that seems to happen in the real world. It only happens to people like me as small children. Uh, but but you have all these different points of failure. And with stage rockets, another one of the real frustrations that we brought up last week is they do have to drop these earlier components. So we see with the, the Falcon 9s and the Falcon Heavy now that those first stages are currently returning to nice friendly landing sites and happily landing upright in this amazing synchronized routine. But we still don't trust that this is going to happen consistently. And if they missed and landed on a suburb, that would be bad. And so currently, for most of our normal low Earth orbit launches, uh, many of our different geosynchronous orbits, we want to launch from the East Coast so that we can take advantage of the rate of rotation of the planet, launch out towards Europe, and then make sure that our early stages uh, either land on a barge, land on the coast with nothing between them and the ocean to crash onto. Right. Uh, yeah, it, garbage collection. It's a problem. Don't throw garbage at other people. And, well, and we mentioned yeah. this. We mentioned this last week. I maybe that the Chinese um, rockets, because they don't have a lot of space in place, and they don't have a a eastern or sorry, a uh, you know a yeah. We're trying to think here, but they well they, they have an east coast. They, it just has right. Japan off of it. Right, right, right. But the point being that that it's that they're they don't have a lot of space and they're launching their rockets in over populated areas and these boosters are coming down in forests and and things like that. But uh, you know anyone you know you talked about that sort of the, a lot of moving parts. I mean anyone who's played the Kerbal Space Program, I defy you the first time you play that game to get the staging right. That what you're gonna do is you're gonna put you're gonna stack up all your rockets on your first multi-stage affair and you're gonna mess up the staging because it is it's, it's like a kind of programming and so your rocket's gonna take off and then the whole thing's just gonna come apart or the middle stages are gonna go off or the stages are gonna fail and you have no way to make it go so so I think you know people have done model rocketry but now Kerbal Space Program lets you experience this. Very quickly, that staging yes. is, a, is a very, very uh, complicated affair. Um, let's talk about some of, you know, we talked briefly about the Saturn. Sorry, you talked about the Saturn. We talked about the space shuttle. What are some different configurations that we can see these staging arrangements happen in? Well, one of the, the big ones that many of us are eagerly waiting for the next launch of is the Delta IV Heavy. This is uh, one of the most used primary rocket situations, the Delta. It's, it's, uh, it just goes kind of trustworthy system. And the Falcon IV Heavy, uh, it's, it's been kind of sort of in use since 2004, by which I mean uh, there was like a partial failure early on, but since then, it's been used to do things like uh, an uncrewed test flight of the Orion multipurpose crew vehicle. Uh, we are waiting for it to launch the Parker Solar Probe. And this is another one of those systems that has that multi-stage central core, and then it has the side boosters attached. And so we have this combination of parallel and tandem where you have the central core with multiple stages and then you have these side boosters as well. Um, and let's go back to sort of like one of the most famous ones, of course, which is the Saturn V. How did that one operate? So the Saturn V was a series of series stages. There was three different stages that each got to a different part in the trajectory. And it was from the Saturns that we actually learned one of the big problems that you have with these multi-stage rockets is they leave junk everywhere. Now that first stage, it's coming back down. But stages above that periodically get abandoned in orbit where we stop calling them useful rocket stages and start calling them uh, debris, potentially harmful debris, debris that might explode. 
And it's from these early rocket launches that we learned the necessity uh, to, this was a new word I learned uh, prepping for the show, basically uh, increased passivity of these rocket stages where the idea is you have to jettison anything that might explode. So you now have an empty cylinder floating through space instead of an explosive empty cylinder floating through space. Like you've got to jettison whatever fuel is left inside. You right. have to jettison whatever fuel, whatever explosive components it might have, because uh, a lot of these things will use minor explosives to separate the stages, to separate off the uh, boosters on the side. Uh, so there's lots of little things that can go boom in the night, and you have to get rid of them. Throw out your explosives, people. Throw out your explosives. But when you really think about the Saturn V and the trips to the Apollo like the whole Apollo mission, they were more than a three stage rocket. I mean, when you think about, right, there was the three stages just to get the the main part of the spacecraft into space, but then you had to go out to the lunar, you had to get to the lunar orbit and then you had to land on the moon and then you had to come back and then you had to boost from the moon back to earth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Someone and did a calculation. There was like, I, I feel like it was Amy. Anyway, uh, there was a, and I believe the technical number was a bajillion rocket nozzles used on that mission when you added yeah. up all of the attitude stuff and all of the boost rockets and all of that. Like it just went on and on and on. And and this is where you start separating the what are stages from what is you have liberated your internal spaceship to go do its own thing. We, we recently saw with SpaceX a gorgeous demonstration of this when they launched their Tesla. I'm not going to go into the politics and the morality of launching a Tesla. I am going to say this was an excellent uh, production that explains all the different parts because we did see those first stages for the side boosters come down and land. We did see the central core uh, not land. Uh, and then we saw that second stage that continued to push it higher and higher and higher. And then we saw the fairing separation. And it's in that fairing separation that the cargo is set free. And that cargo is separate from the space launch system. And with the Apollo missions, that cargo was the lunar landing module, the command module, all of these different parts that allowed us to make it through cislunar space, get around the moon, land, return, uh, and basically make it back home. So that is a separate computational electronic engine firing entity uh, a good way to think of it for the children of the 80s like us is I don't know if you remember the Knight Rider TV show where Kit would drive up into the back of that semi-truck. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, sure. Well, Kit was not part of the semi-truck. So you can think of the semi-truck as the rocket that's carrying around the cargo that also has its own capacity to, in this case, uh, drive, or if you happen to be uh, the Apollo modules to fly. So let's talk about, uh, you know, some of the interesting multi-staged affairs that are coming up shortly. And I think the one that we should definitely talk about is the BFR, the, the big, fantastic, fabulous. Fab fabulous rocket coming from SpaceX. How, I mean, that's a multi-staged affair. How is that going to work compared to, say, something like the space launch system coming from NASA? So so with, with BFR, what we start to worry about is uh, details of just how do they get all of the parts to fire simultaneously. With, with the space launch systems, it's that tried and true central core, two side boosters, central core, two side boosters. We did that with the Delta. We did that with the space shuttle. We've seen with the Falcon Heavy, different fuel components. It's no longer the solid rocket and liquid core. Uh, but, but this is something we know how to do. Uh, I'm trying to pull up the latest development pictures of the the BFR because it it's supposed to have a lot more than two side boosters, if I remember things. Well, no, correctly. I mean the BFR. Well, the BFR's got the 
is, is essentially a two-stage rocket, right? Okay. So the bottom stage, the booster, the BFB, the big fabulous booster, is going to be very similar to the existing SpaceX first stage, right? That it's going to be this... But it's going to have a ludicrous number of these brand new Raptor engines that that SpaceX is working on. I believe it's in the 30s. I mean, there was 39. I forget the exact number it's right now. It's 31. 31. I've, I've now, okay. Yes. All right. So, so that, I misremembered it. You're, you're right. It wasn't side boosters. It was central right, engines. Right. And then you have the top portion, which is the BFS, the big fantastic spaceship. And that is going to have as well its own engines and be able to uh, be able to fly. And so you're going to stack the BFS on top of the BFB. That whole stack is going to fly to space, and then both are going to be fully reusable. So the BFB is going to just return to roughly the launch site in the same way that the uh, the way that the Falcon 9 boosters do. And then the the top part, the BFS, is going to deliver the cargo to space do what it needs to do and then do the do the same thing and return to return to earth and land near the launch facility or they'll be able to be used in a expendable manner which where the whole thing is destroyed but a lot of cargo gets blasted into space and it's it's going to be interesting to see all the computational work that's required to get all 31 of those Raptor engines firing simultaneously enough, steering, maintaining, balance. And, and this is where a lot of these systems start to cause heart palpitations, is if you don't have simultaneous firing of all of these things, it's sort of like uh, jumping with your right foot before your left, you're probably going to fall over sideways. The, and, well, the the Soviets learned this horrible mistake with their N one rocket when they were trying to do their own trip to the moon. It was while well, the Saturn V was this stack of a fairly small number of engines. The the N one was a gigantic number of of engines, and and this was before fancy computers, and they couldn't get the timing right, and these things just kept detonating. The Falcon Heavy had 27 engines, right? Yes. Three times nine. No, wait. Yes, 27. So that is more engines that have ever been, been operated simultaneously. Yes. <laughs> so so we're, we're making great progress by being able to use new and more kinds of engines in parallel to control all of these different things in truly crazy and awesome ways. And I, I can't wait to see what comes out of all of these different plans. There's... We, we had the original idea coming out of SpaceX for their ITS launch vehicle, which was another one of these ludicrous vehicles, their uh, interplanetary transport system that was going to be able to launch to low Earth orbit 550 tons. And we haven't been able to imagine this kind yeah. of, of mass in my entire life and now we're like yeah why not let's just like launch instead of building a super lightweight james webb let's just like build a new version of the vlt and just make make some minor adjustments and we're good uh this is a new way of thinking so if stage rockets are the way and you know ideally reusable why what are the limits to this why aren't there 10 stage rockets it really starts to come down to then you're adding weight with all of the control systems on each stage. So you have to find this magical balance. And it's not magical. You have to find this computational convergence of your equations balance, which feels like magic, uh, between each stage has electronics, has engines, has all the bits and pieces that allow them to separate, and all that mass adds up, 
and then you are losing that mass, but the first stage still has to launch the six stages above it and all of their engines. And there's trade-offs on how many stages do you want to use so that you can drop the appropriate amount of garbage and how fast does the weight from each of those stages add up, limiting your ability to launch more effectively. And, and it is that, as you said, you know, it's the weight of the nozzles, the weight of the electronics that really decide whether you're going to, because I guess in a perfect world, if, the, if all of that stuff weighed almost nothing, although the tank part weighed a lot, then you yes. would make more stages and you would just slough them off as quickly as you could. And then you would in the end have, you know, the sort of the perfect rocket equation and this is one of those things that you see in model rocketry where people do launch eight stage, 12 stage, insane rockets. And this is because the only thing you need to go between the stages is a, a special fuse that will use your first stage to launch your second stage, use your second stage to, to light your third stage. And you have this super slow acceleration at the beginning where that first D is like, I don't know how I'm gonna do this, but then it gets faster and faster and faster as it goes because you can accelerate over a much longer period of time. And uh, it's pretty awesome. Now, the one thing I do wanna hit on is the first multi-stage rockets actually like predate our countries. <laughs> this is this is one of those things we we forget that rockets uh, aren't a modern thing. Sure, Goddard was the first one to figure out how to do liquid rockets, but folks in China and Korea were in the 1400s and onwards working to develop uh, fireworks, working to develop rocket powered arrows working to create baby missiles that they fired at one another and and so this is not a new concept it is just a modernly perfected to go to outer space instead of to like destroy things concept but as early as the 1400s they were able to get rockets rocket arrows that went 200 meters and that's kind of cool I've never done any model rocketry. What is wrong? I know, I know, I know, I know. Like, I think I've been around for like one model rocket launch. I've taken. You have you've got done, to do this. You've done a bunch of it. I've, I have, I have launched so many rockets <laughs> and exploded so many lock rockets and climbed trees to retrieve rockets. Well, let's and cue that up for an episode then, because <laughs> I have, you know, and then we can talk about your experiences and how to get into the hobby of model rocketry and how not to. Uh, to to blow your hand off well i i think actually well, i actually tried that one once okay. as well uh but the most important lesson i learned is on the rockets that are designed to launch things and critters only launch critters with exoskeletons because critters that don't have exoskeletons can't sustain high g's and when you can't find a cricket to crash to a cricket to launch, not crash, to launch, uh, do not replace the cricket with an earthworm. You will regret all of your choices and the earthworm will regret them more. I'm going to suggest don't ever launch anything alive. Oh, crickets are fine. They may not like it, but they're fine. All right. All right. Well, we'll uh, figure out what to do uh, into the future. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us. And we'll see you next week, Pamela. Sounds great. Bye-bye. I cannot believe you haven't launched rockets. They're do you, fun. Do you, do you need more time to come to grips with this this emotionally? No, I just some like grieving time. You're you need? have children. I you know. have like I know. You have prevented your children from a very important <laughs> stage in growing up as a nerd. I'm a monster. I wouldn't go that far, yeah. but you have disappointed me. I know. Yeah, no, I believe my wife will not hear of of uh, insects flying.
I, as I said, exoskeleton ones are totally cool with it. You, even mm. if like your parachute yeah. doesn't deploy, <laughs> they're fine. Arjun says, Cricket, send your emails to Pamela Gay. I think that's fine. <laughs> I, I, when you're brought up on a tribunal, just remember, I was, I for one, welcome our super, welcome our super cricket overlords. It was Pamela <coughs> who sent you to space. All right, there was a bunch of questions that came in. Let's uh, let's dig through them. After launch rockets, you live on an island. I live on a very flammable island. Is part of the problem? Go to the beach. Yeah. Arjun wants to know, how do they handle the liquid fuel that's going to be bouncing around during launch? It's so pressurized, there's no bouncing occurring. No sloshing. No, no. It's just sort of like, atoms can't move. We're kind of, well, I mean, they can. the atoms can move, but there's no gaps, there's no sloshing. It's just, it is what it is. It's, it's like when you take a a water bottle and you fill it to the absolute top so that as you spin on the lid water comes out and there's no air inside and you can rotate it and and you don't really see anything changing now try this with a couple drops of ink and you'll see how little that ink moves as uh you move the container around uh nicole angelo mendoza really 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 wants you to say hi hi <laughs> she's in the philippines so uh, it's 4.30 I love, I love that part of the world. I haven't been to the Philippines yet, but I've been to Indonesia. And you guys have, like, the most amazing geography. And I have friends from the International Year of Astronomy from the Philippines who just, like, totally rocked it. It was cool. Um, more questions. More questions. Let's see. All right. Here's a good one. Lithobreak, is NASA's plan to stop funding the ISS their choice or the result of U.S. politics? I'd like to see a new station and possibly more so, but want to see the fireball of the ISS deorbiting. So, so are, are you familiar with the news? 2025. Yeah, I, you know, all of this stuff is at the whim of whoever is currently in the government and 2025 is many, many elections away. So 2025, that's six years. So uh, when, so we have a presidential election in 2020, another one in 2024. So we are guaranteed no matter what, unless they rewrite the constitution, we will have a new administration by then. So there's no way to know if that will actually happen. Right. And I'm just going to go with that. Yeah. I'm just going to go with no that. No matter what, there will be a new administration. And yeah. that's a perfectly politically neutral thing to state. You are literally just describing the laws of your government. Well, and I think back to all of the heartbreak that we went through with the HST being canceled, not canceled, canceled, not canceled, canceled, not canceled. And and I have no idea when HST will stop producing amazing science data. I just know it was supposed to be many years ago. And I'm joyful that we still have an HST and I'm not going to count my dead space stations until they're abandoned by humans. Right. I, I mean, it is interesting. Like it, it can't last forever. And if you read the, I highly recommend you read Endurance, which was Scott Kelly's book about his year in space. And they spend a tremendous amount of time maintaining that station. They are yeah. mechanics as much as they are astronauts, astro mechanics. Mm -hmm. And they spend a ton of time fixing, especially, I mean, Scott Kelly's bugbear is the carbon dioxide scrubbers because he's really sensitive to the level of carbon dioxide in the station oh, and geez. can't stand it when it's too high and so his it, and had to fix it and had to fix other things and toilets and all kinds of things right and so those stations are i mean that station is getting old and yes it is a machine the most complicated machine humanity has ever built but it is a machine and it is and with all machines, there is this time when you, when you 
repair the machine and there's a time when you throw the machine away and you get the next version of the machine which in this case is going to be the deep space gateway but you're talking to someone who drives a 1997 jeep wrangler oh for sure no i i i, I drove my beloved 1992 volvo until about three years ago but yeah. i did replace it for a 2010 honda civic like at a certain point I don't, I'm not sure how are you going to drive that Wrangler forever? At some point, you're going to sell it, right? At some you're point, it will it. be, I, at some point, it will no longer be able to be repaired and I will donate it to the local NPR station, but it's, it's going to be kept until it is no longer viable to be maintained. Yes. And that, and that's it. That's, that's the decision that you make. We don't yeah. know what the, date that that's going to happen will be right mm -hmm. and the russians had originally said they were going to abandon it earlier and now they're up to 2028 yeah and, so and they were going to pull out their command module originally mm -hmm. yeah so uh, you know i think you're exactly right there are many more administrations it's one thing to say i think nasa should blah 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 right it's another thing to actually say all right abandon the space station like wrapping up the 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 space shuttle that was a difficult decision and it took longer than anyone was expecting and a big yes. part of it was you see the replacement for the space shuttle yeah didn't happen the way anyone had anticipated it was going to be the aries with the constellation program then it was going to be the it was going to now it's the space launch system like it's there is this this inertia that goes on in in both directions and, and with the International Space Station, that critter took forever to build. They, they started constructing it while I was a graduate student. And it was just this slow slog to get it fully constructed. And I think they're there. I think they're as far as we're going to get. Um, other than replacing and testing things like with the Bigelow module, module attached. But they pretty much would need to start building something now if they want to have a large thing ready to go by the time we switch. So either they're looking to put 100% of their funding and effort into the Deep Space Gateway, which needs only a couple of launches of a not yet completed rocket, um, yeah, I, I have a feeling this is really going to be like the HST and James yes. Webb Space Telescope, where where they say they can't build the second until they defund the first, but things end up dragging on due to delay, delays in the second, forcing the elongation of the first. Yeah, and it's just reality, right? Like, is the is it failing then it's going to need to be abandoned sooner is mm -hmm. it doing still pretty great and there's some science that could that could get done still then they'll keep extending it yeah yeah it's it's not the most pleasant environment in the world from what i understand it's kind of stinky yeah. kind of vibrating yeah loud but it's what we've got yeah. and yeah for sure and yeah i uh yeah you've got you work with the station that you have Yes. Uh, Arjun wants to know, do you think that China and U.S. private industry will take over the lead in space exploration? Um, so, so China isn't private. China is very, very government run. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think it's fair to say that China, SpaceX, and the new space community in general, because there's a lot of other partners out there. They're just not as bright and shiny as SpaceX right now. I, I do think that a lot of these new space private companies, as well as China and India, are going to be the ones who are doing a lot of pushing the boundaries because the, the funding, the human resources, the drive is easier to maintain continuity on. Yeah. Uh, SpaceX is up to, I think they're going to launch 50% more rockets this year than they did last year. The Chinese are catching up quickly. Uh, there's some interesting charts that you can see, but still at the end yeah. of the day, the, the United States has the lion's share of launch capacity 
and you know probably will for a while and and this is because we do have such a large backlog of the smaller older rockets the delta series the atlas series all of these are amazing and they they're just workhorses mm -hmm. it's the new super fail. heavy stuff right yeah right and uh it's going to be interesting to see what happens as we start to wind down on the number of warehoused rockets and components and try and transition to new technologies. Yeah. Um, Gareth Wilton wants to know, what are the advantages of a human space program? We're really, we have thumbs. <laughs> That's um, it. <laughs> well, take that. Yes, robot. yes, it is. So I, mean, it's not just the fact that we have thumbs. It's also the fact that we can totally innovate on the fly to figure things out better than our current robots can. So human beings really have the advantage when it comes to on the fly standing there and figuring out which rock to pick up instead of having to wait for the next downlink to the earth and the time travel for the signals and have people on earth say which rock to pick up. Uh, we are really good at figuring out how to break into the Hubble Space Telescope to replace components that were never meant to be replaced on orbit uh, and how to fix things on the fly. And so it's that fix, repair, create auto mechanic in space aspect that really human beings still have nailed. We haven't figured out how to successfully build, launch, deploy, use on a regular basis, little flying around rovers that can grab things, repair things, release things. It's been in the discussion since the early 80s. It's one of those things we want to build. Mm -hmm. but we just haven't got there. But on the downside, we're made of meat. It's true. And... And when you see, like, I don't know if you've seen that new r robot that opened a door for its little buddy yes. robot, right? Yes. So, Boston Dynamics yeah. is amazing. So, so I think that that the the that argument, I I I personally can't stand that argument that 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 there's any valuable reason to have human beings doing scientific work in space it's true we have thumbs but we're made of meat and the robots you know are going to have thumbs very soon and that is and, I, and so i think if you if you plant your flag there and go as long as ro as people are better than robots then people are the right thing to use to explore space that is an argument that you will eventually lose because there it's will true. come up a robot with like a thousand thumbs right yes and it's and you'll be like Fine, and it will be built by canada and we sure yeah exactly right <laughs> um you know some boston dynamics the multi-thumbed explorer and it's just going to be able to to open up anything that is required pick up any rock and and move it around that we're the, in my opinion the reason human space exploration is important is because humans want to go to space and the only way to figure out how to send humans to space is to send humans to space that's and, it and this this gets from the need to send humans to the want to send humans and it's okay to want to send humans to space the question was, why do we need to send humans? And currently the answer is thumbs. And you're right. That will become a deprecated argument. Yeah. And then and then it's just, you know, how do you know how to have humans live in space until you send humans to space? And I think it makes it really simple because I, I feel like that was part of the problem with some of the other arguments in the past is, is that as long as you keep saying, you know, we need to send humans because – they're going to be much better. You know, it's better to have a geologist who's right there on the ground and can pick up a rock and know what it's looking at until a robot knows better and is able to oh, you yeah. know, perform a thousand geological measurements per second better than the best geologist you've got. Like at a certain point, as you know, every single AI one of those arguments is developing comes to an end. really oh, yeah. fast. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Abraham Cottrell notes that koalas have more thumbs and they aren't particularly useful. So there you go. Okay. More thumbs does not necessarily make for a better astronaut, a better 
koala astronauts, koala knots. Anyway, <laughs> she says instead of the Canada arm, will be the Canada thumb. I saw that. That was excellent. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, before we go any further, go ahead. More questions. We've got like another eight minutes. It's your time. Use it up. But uh, I want to give a big shout out, as always, to our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Yes. The WSHcrew.space. They are the community people that are talking down here. They are the producers of the Weekly Space Hangout. They are the ones who organize all of our guests, and we couldn't do this show without them. So if you want to be part of the conversation, if you're watching this live and you want to go to the take take this to the next level, join the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Go to WSHcrew.space. You get access to the Slack community. I'm there. Pamela's there. All the yep. people from the Weekly Space Hangout crew are there, and it's the party just continues. And... And you get to find out about all the other stuff the two of us do because uh, we do a bunch of streaming on Twitch related to Cosmic Quest. Fraser has his video series. Uh, I also personally do some streaming. Fraser periodically plays video games online. And, and the Weekly Space Hangout crew, it's where we hang out as humans. Mm -hmm. So come join us as humans. Yeah. And again, WSHcrew.space. Come on, questions. Questions, questions, questions. Hit me. <laughs> That's awesome. Slack, Slack bot. Just hit us with the party. A potluck on Tuesday. <laughs> Richard Drum would like to see a radio telescope in orbit around the moon. No gravity warp its dish and no regolith to abrade the works and obviously no radio signals to interrupt it. What do you think? Radio dish... A radio observatory. We don't need one orbiting, orbiting the, the moon. moon. No, we. So you're you're much better putting it in a, a an orbit like the one we're going to stick James Webb in uh, that maintains a constant position relative to the Earth Moon or relative to the Earth Sun. The the issue with having something orbit the moon is it doesn't have a lot of gravity. So you're going to be going around fairly quickly and orbiting something fairly quickly means it's hard to stay on topic on, not on topic. It's hard to stay on target for any long period of time. Uh, you want to stick things in places where they can linger and track and get a long period of data. And, and I guess what you're saying is use distance, use the, cube law to get far away from the earth as opposed to or the inverse cube law as opposed to tr just try to use the moon as a shield get right. farther away so that the radio signals from earth are are not that much of a problem and you can and you can then have a fairly quiet place to listen to the universe well the thing is if you're orbiting the moon uh you're you're going to spend part of your time protected from the Earth's uh, radio signals and part of your time exposed to it. And it's going to be roughly every 45 minutes, it switches which situation you're in. So with a 100 minute-ish, 120 minute-ish orbital period going around the moon, it it's not very satisfactory. So if you do want the quiet, then you go for the Earth-Moon Lagrange point on the far side. Yeah, because it's like about a million and a half kilometers away from Earth, while the Moon is uh, two hundred and eighty thousand kilometers from Earth. But but here you're running into the issue of you now need something. I uh, actually what you need is a whole series of somethings that can send the signals from that radio dish back to Earth as they look around the Moon. Uh, Quadlibit recommended or asked a question: Are there, you know, can we ever get to space without rockets? Maybe that's a whole episode. Oh, rocket yeah, alternatives. yeah, we can do that. Sure. So we can talk about mass drivers and railguns and yeah, things like that. Um, photonic propulsion systems and railguns. Yes, and railguns. That's yes, railguns. Uh, Ron Hook is saying I should try water rockets. I have done water rockets. Okay. Yeah. So I haven't, I just haven't bought the little 
rocket motors and and built rockets and, and flown them and now i just i feel like a like a, just a terrible father i <laughs> i'm just i really have neglected my children at this deep and meaningful way as it relates i, I it's took them fixable. to see an eclipse i know come on I, I we go watch the percy meteor shower every year yeah, all right you need to let them play with fire i really do yeah rockets uh, but then it, the, I, I'm just continuing the cycle. My parents didn't play with rockets with me either. So And you didn't, like, figure it out on your own? That's mm. what I did. Really, of course you did. That's awesome. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just reading the comments. Yeah. <laughs> Don't the Homer Kane. No, I was the Alka Seltzer and Coke rocket. Mm. I'm sure NASA. Did you see NASA got someone sent that to NASA? No. Um, someone sent NASA the you know the Diet Coke and Menthos, Menthos, and yeah, yeah, and someone had sent that to sent the, you know it sort of. <laughs> oh great! It's already a meme. <laughs> that's fine, but I want to see a robot with a thousand thumbs. <laughs> now that's a meme. That is awesome. Thank you, Tom. Please tweet that so I can retweet it. All right. Uh, Gaudi Saad asks, how come we don't see real pictures of stuff in space? Only graphics. Well, huh? I, I did a whole video all about the real pictures of spacecraft taken yeah. from space. It's like I go through dozens of examples of really cool pictures of spacecraft taken from space but why Image in general detective we have a bunch in it of spacecraft taken from space yeah because it's the astronauts taking pictures of the things attached to the iss the things visiting the iss so go to cosmoquest.org and click on the picture of the planet earth and you'll periodically run across photos of spacecraft taken from yeah. the ISS my, by the astronauts. My favorite is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter took pictures of the Curiosity spacecraft as it was landing. Yes. And you can see the parachute yes. and the and the aeroshell, you know, and the and the and the sky crane underneath and and you can see it sort of making its way down to the surface of Mars, which is yes. which is awesome. I really yes. like that. Uh, Gordon notes, now we know who the Alpha Geek is. Hint, it's not Fraser. I'm amazed that this was not clear, that by every <laughs> concept, Pamela is by far the greater Alpha Geek than than I am. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We, I don't even hold a candle to her level of geekitude. You hold a candle. One, but... <laughs> one tiny candle <laughs> shining in the dark. Yeah. Yeah, you are um, absolutely a legit... Um, space nerd. Everyone who's been to space camp, put up your hand. <laughs> everyone Multiple who's, times. Everyone who's been to Russia and worked on Multiple astronomy. Times. Yeah, so anyway, no, absolutely. All right. Well, I think we've reached the end of our hour. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this week. Uh, super fun. We'll figure out what's going to happen next week. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone, to the WSH crew. And uh, this should show up as an episode in your podcatcher. See you later, everyone. Bye-bye.